Thank you very much for the invitation. <coughs> well, first I have to apologize that the lectures were actually developed for first a postgraduate course in Vienna, and then I gave a three-day course similar in Prague, so there is still the label of Prague lecture here. Uh, there may be too much material, but it's more important that you understand, so please do interrupt me if you have questions because otherwise you really get lost and uh, we'll see how far we get so the outline of the first lecture is i want to i want to convince you that there is a, a notion of graph polynomial and a topic of research here and actually there is a topic of of open research where you can uh, you can write theses and you can do, there are plenty of open questions. We will have a Dachstuhl seminar next, next year, <coughs> inviting 60 world experts on, on this field to, to discuss further, further problems, so, so there is really some interest here also. So I will have uh, introducing graph polynomials. Now somebody once told me, you see graph polynomials are, I will tell you, is, is a functor which gives every graph a polynomial and hopefully what people hope is that by coding it into polynomial you can use algebraic techniques to extract information about the graph okay and this is this is uh, and uh, there is evidence that sometimes this works and uh, so so uh, there are some prominent graph polynomials which are studied in the last hundred years and there are some less prominent things which people tried. So what I will present to you today is a zoo. And somebody once suggested I should write a paper from a zoo to a zoology. So in the zoo you have famous animals like elephants and giraffes and crocodiles, which every child wants to see. There. And you have exotic animals, which nobody knows about. And uh, I'm Dr. Doolittle and you bring me a new animal and I want to put it in the zoo, but I also would like to classify it. So, so what I, what I, the purpose of the three-day lecture is first to convince you that there is an interesting zoo, and then to convince you that there are interesting questions to get to a zoology, if you want, in this sense. So here we have an introduction, then we have the prominent crocodiles and <coughs> elephants and everything. And then I will start to tell you how I would like to compare those uh, animals, if we stay in this metaphor, and uh, this is how far we get. There will be plenty of examples and we can skip some of them if we don't need that. So first, as everybody knows, uh, two graphs. A graph is given by a set of vertices and a set of edges. And graph theorists, contrary to logicians, have two ways of looking at this. One is that the vertices is a set and the edge is a relation, edge relation. Two vertices are related to each other. It's a symmetric relation if you speak of graphs. It's an asymmetric relation if you speak of directed graphs. But you, you cannot have multiple edges because from a, if it's a relation, you can't have two items which, which uh, relate the same elements together. So graph theorists do like to have multiple edges. So they look at it sometimes as a, as a set of vertices and a set of edges, and additionally, uh, edge relation uh, or uh, incidence relation, saying that a certain vertex sits on a certain edge. From a graph theoretic point of view, this is the same. From a logical point of view, this is slightly different. But in any case, we say that two graphs uh, are isomorphic, if there is a 1-1 one, one map, uh, uh, this should be probably V, uh, from the vertices to the vertices, which respects the, the relation. And we, we say that to be right isomorphism like this. What, what is that symbol, the plus symbol, the plus symbol? It's also a mistake. Uh, this should be... Equal. Yeah, equal. Equal. <laughs> e, which is we don't write the G all the time, so E equals EG is a subset of, of this. Okay, but this is your, your, this I suppose you learn in any course 
on graph theory. Now the other thing we will look at, we will look at rings. Uh, the theory can be done in general, but we don't want to be too general. So we have as particular cases of rings. We have a Boolean ring with two elements, uh, which in some sense is the same as a, as a field uh, over Z, though the relations are not exactly the same, but they are in be interpretable if you know to go from here to here and you know how to go from here to here. We have the ring of integers, we have the polynomial ring with one indeterminate and we may have a polynomial ring with many indeterminates and we could have also instead of z any real number or complex numbers and again uh, polynomial rings over those. Uh, and uh, the graph polynomial uh, or a graph invariant over a ring is a function which maps graphs into elements of the ring which can be elements or, or polynomials, if it's a polynomial. <coughs> and we say the function f is uh, invariant if on two isomorphic graphs it gives the same value. Okay, so if you take Distel's book, which I understand is very popular here, <coughs> and you look there, there are graph properties which are Boolean invariants, so they happen to be true or false, and there are numeric invariants like the uh, number of connected components or the size of the vertex set or the size of the edge set or the number of uh, no, blocks or, or the girth or whatever you find. So if you go through the index of distal, uh, actually he is mostly interested, or the graph theorists in general are mostly interested in integer valued uh, graph parameters rather than in in Boolean properties, typical Boolean properties would be planar, uh, Hamiltonian, and thing here. So here we go through. Boolean graphs invariants are connectedness, regular, regular of a fixed degree, any first order in logic, first order expressible property of a graph, like the triangle free or something like this, any second order expressible graph property where you use a stronger language, second order logic. Uh, uh, but uh, properties can be non, don't have to be related to logic. Any class of graphs which is closed under isomorphism is a property, and then you can uh, say I'm in it or I'm not in it. So there are continuum many Boolean graph invariants uh, uh, to, to talk about. Numeric graph invariants are uh, cardinality of any of the sets, V or E, the number of connected components, the coloring number, the size of a maximal clique, the diameter, the radius, the, the girth, uh, or, or whatever. I mean, take distal book and look in the index. You, you find, you find uh, uh, many, many things which are studied of this form. Now, graph polynomials are a special case where the, the graph invariant is not an element in a, in a, in a ring uh, as such, but in a polynomial ring over some other ring or field, uh, particularly examples are polynomials over Z uh, or uh, in one or many variables. So po graph polynomials appear for the first time as such, no, they appear before, but as an as, as object of study with more than one example, they appear in a famous book by Norman Biggs, Algebraic Graph Theory, which was first published in 73 as his thesis and to show that it is really important, it was reprinted 20 years later. So if your thesis is reprinted 20 years later, you can be proud. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, so here is the first, historically the first uh, example, which is not quite correct. There is uh, something about the same period which has infinitely many indeterminates, which is called sometimes D graph polynomial, which I don't want to speak about. So I don't say more about this. But anyhow, so in, in one variable, the first, in one indeterminate, the first uh, graph polynomial is the chromatic polynomial. And actually, the interesting part is it doesn't appear. It doesn't appear as a polynomial, but it appears by a, a definition, chi for chromatic of graph and the variable x is the number of vertex colorings of G with X colors. So at the, at the beginning, X is an integer. 
So you have uh, g of uh, he of g one, two, three, zero. Uh, but then Birkhoff proved, we will see in a moment, that it is a polynomial in this uh, integer. Therefore, you have a natural extension to to polynomials in arbitrary extension of the ring. So you can think of x also as a strange values, one half pi minus one. And we will see that this, this turns actually out to be interesting. Now, the chromatic chromaticity and chromatic polynomial has a very, very rich literature. There is a book by Dong, Ko, and Theo from Singapore, Chromatic Polynomials and Chromaticity of Graphs uh, in 2005, which is about 300 pages information about uh, chromatic polynomial. This is just to, to convince you that at least somebody bothered to write uh, 300 pages on this topic. Uh, now, what can you do? So fine, you have, you have found an object which maps graphs into polynomials. Okay. In some sense, you can ask, OK, I found this. What can I do with it? And what is your imagination? I mean, the moment I tell you here is an object which maps graphs into polynomials. Being polynomial, you can study the zeros of the polynomial. You can try to interpret the coefficients as graph parameters. You can try to interpret evaluations of this polynomial as something meaningful about graphs. You can study graphs which are uniquely determined by their polynomial. Uh, and hopefully, if you have a very strong polynomial, then every graph is uniquely determined by its polynomial. But this, in general, will not be the case. You can study study graph classes having the same graph polynomial. You can study the strength of the graph invariant in some sense. So, so OK, this is what you, what you can do. So let's see in, in, a, in an application what people have done. And I will go back now to the chromatic polynomial. And I give you a couple of slides, which you don't have to understand in depth but which should give you the flavor of what has been done with this strange object for the last uh, 100 years. So here is the, the, here is the uh, Birkhoff's uh, statement and proof. Uh, what we have to show is that if you define he as the number of proper colorings of G with x many colors, provided x is an integer, uh, or a positive integer, that, that it happens to be a polynomial. And actually, the polynomial has a degree which has the number of vertices uh, as, as its degree. Okay. So what you do is, and maybe I, I should draw you a picture, because the, the picture proof is, is much more convincing than, than everything else. So I have my graph. Now what I want to say here is assume there was an edge here and you count. So this is the number of proper colorings, proper colorings of G without E. So here without E. Here with E and here contracted. So we write this like this. Here is a U V, U V, and U equals V. And actually here U different from V. And we note that the number of colorings here equals the number of colorings here plus the number of colorings here. In the following sense, that if you have a proper coloring of this graph without the E, then if the value of the coloring is different uh, from U and V, then you can also add the edge here, and it's still a coloring. And if the value is the same, you cannot do this, but then you can do this, and the number of colorings is the same. And then you do an induction, and you say, if I don't have edges at all, then the number of colorings is just a number of maps from V to the 
number of colors, and then you do an induction, which is a polynomial, and then you do an induction over the number of edges, and you use this equation to show that you stay in the, in the polynomial ring. Okay. And this is what is written here in, 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 in ASCII code or whatever in words. So, so this is not only a, a cute proof, because you can <laughs> explain it like this, but it is also a proof which was very influential because it noted this is called the deletion, deletion of E, and it's denoted by G minus E. And this is called, this is G actually, with E, and this is G contracted E contraction. And people got very excited about looking at graphs in terms of deletion and contraction after Birkhoff's proof and, uh, and uh, found out that this is very important in many, many respects. So indeed, the, the whole picture of Seymour and Robertson is exploring to what extent you can push uh, <coughs> graph theory uh, along the, the study of deletion and contractions of graphs. Now, once you know it is a polynomial, you can ask yourself how to write it. And you can write it in several ways. You can say, okay, I take as a basis of my polynomial ring x to the power 0, x to the power 1, x to the power 2 as a set of polynomials. And then I have a unique presentation of my polynomial with coefficients b, i, g times x, e, i. So this is one presentation. And this presentation has the nice property that it is multiplicative in the sense that if I have a disjoint union of two graphs, then in this presentation the polynomial can be computed by multiplying the polynomial of the <coughs> composing graphs. On the other hand, you'll see in a moment. Yeah, this is true, this is okay, but uh, I want to make a point now. If you choose a different presentation, and you choose a different presentation which is spaced like this, instead of x to the i, you choose x to the falling factorial i. So this, these things are x i equals x times x minus 1 times times x minus i plus 1. And this also forms the basis of the polynomial ring. So you have a unique presentation of the polynomial using this basis and some other coefficients c. Now it turns out, and I won't go now into the details, you can, you can define a product for those bases in a canonical way, and then you will find out that if you take the join of two graphs. What is the join of two graphs? You have a graph here, G1. You have a graph here, G2. And you connect everybody with everybody. OK? This is the join. And then you get that the join of two graphs can be computed as the product co correspondingly defined in this presentation of the two composing uh, graphs. So it shows that, you know, that the way you choose the, the basis, you have different nice properties of a certain polynomial. Now we have some uh, <coughs> nice observations. One of them is if you have a tree with n vertices, then the polynomial, the chromatic polynomial, will always be x times x minus 1 to the power n minus 1. And the amazing thing is the converse. If you have a simple graph and, and the polynomial of this graph happens to be this particular polynomial, then g happens to be a tree. Okay. So here you get here you get the characterization of trees. You take any, any graph, you compute the chromatic polynomial, 
I don't tell you how difficult it is to compute. <laughs> but you are from that. No, we are before complexity theory in some sense. I mean, the, the, and so people thought everything you can do in, in, a, in a ring is, is, is easy. So you compute the chromatic polynomial. And if you get that it happens to be this polynomial after simplification, then you know, hurrah, my graph is a tree. Now, Thomason extended this, and he showed that if g has three width, everybody knows here what is three width of a graph? Hmm? No. So there is a notion, which I won't go into detail now, but there is a notion of three width which somehow measures to what extent the graph is similar to a tree. Okay, so three width one is I am a tree, or rather a forest. 3 with 2 is, uh, I'm almost, <laughs> 3 with 3 is a, a bit less and a bit less. So there is this measure, and Thomason showed that if the measure is k, then for every real number alpha, we have that uh, polynomial does not uh, vanish at this point, for every uh, alpha bigger than, than k. So this somehow gives you an indication, if you compute your graph polynomial, and it vanishes at some point which is bigger than this, then it cannot have 3 with k. So again, this looks like a, a good trick to, to, to decide how difficult it is to do. But again, we, I didn't tell you how difficult it is to, to check 3 with. Uh, now, I got all involved in, in this with a PhD thesis of my student, uh, Udi Rotich. And we extended actually Kursel's theorem to, to, uh, to graph polynomials. And it says that if a graph polynomial with 3 with at most k, uh, no, sorry, if a graph has 3 with at most k, then the chromatic polynomial can be computed in polynomial time. And we have done the same for uh, another notion, which is hopefully popular in this place. And click width, which is a similar measure for, for graphs for somehow, but in a less precise sense, similar to clicks. And we also can do this in, in, in this case. Uh, planar graphs and the chromatic polynomial. So here is a, here is a, a theorem from 1890, which says that every planar graph is five colorable. And in other words, now th this is just to show you that it can be expressed. So this says that if the chromatic polynomial of a graph at the point 5 is different from 0, no, if a graph is planar, then this evaluation must be different from 0. The other words, if you find uh, a 0 uh, at some point, so the graph is not planar. It looks, it looks if it gave you a, a simple test for this. Now, uh, Birkhoff and Lewis proved something which is much stronger, which is, uh, it says, for every real number bigger or equal than 5, the alpha cannot be a 0 of a planar graph. So not only 5 is not a 0 of a planar graph, but also 5.1, 5 5.2, uh, 3 times pi, whatever you want, cannot be a 0 of a planar graph. Now this is much stronger than the, the, the theorem here. Now Apple and Haken, obviously, obviously, I mean, this is well known by now, <laughs> Uh, Proof that every planar graph is four colorable, so this says that four cannot be a zero of a planar graph. And the question which really bothered Birkhoff already, or later other people, is can you find a proof of the four color conjecture which uses the algebraic framework? I mean, not just uh, as a corollary to some big theorem, but can you find an analytic proof? of the four-color conjecture by just showing that if a graph is planar, then four cannot be a zero of the chromatic polynomial. And indeed, Birkhoff and Lewis conjectured in a paper from 46, and this is still open, 
that there are no zeros of planar graphs in the interval 4 and 5, in the whole interval. This is still an open problem. People go on, maybe I will jump because I want to show you other examples, but if you go back to my slides from the, on the internet, people now got very much interested in, in, the, in the place where the zeros are of the chromatic polynomial. Uh, uh, so Woodall in 77 showed for arbitrary graphs there are no negative real roots, this is an easy exercise, but there are no real roots in the open interval between 0 and 1, which is a bit more demanding. Jackson in 93 showed there are no real roots in the semi-open interval 1, 2, 32 over 27. <laughs> so if somebody asks you what is special about 32 and 27, here you have an answer. And it shows also for any epsilon bigger than 0, there is a graph such that uh, you get arbitrary close to this uh, interval. Uh, and Thomason actually refined this even further. So people really looked at where can you have zeros of the chromatic polynomial on the real line. And, uh, okay, so, so I stop here with this. Now, uh, here is one of the most amazing theorems at least when I saw it for the first time, I, I thought this is most amazing. So people ask, what is the meaning of the number of color, colorings of G with minus one color? <laughs> if you take the original definition of He, this is what I read here. It's the number of proper colorings of G with minus one colors. Cuckoo. No, it's not cuckoo. Stanley showed that this happens to be, if you take the absolute value of it, then this happens to be the number of acyclic orientations of a graph. You take every edge, and with probability, not probability, but you have two ways of orienting it. So you have two to the number of edges to give an orientation of the graph. And this counts how many of those happen to be acyclic. And Stanley actually gave also interpretations for minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. And in the meantime, other people gave other interpretations of this. So, so this is somehow, this is a starting point for curiosity. Seemingly, seemingly, we can tickle out of, uh, of the property of this polynomial, we can tickle out information about the graph. So when people started to generalize chromatic polynomial to other cases, they had some of this information in mind. They started earlier, so it's not all of it. Uh, this I want to skip. Okay. Now here is another historic graph polynomial which appears early. Early now is not 1912. What is 1950 plus? And it appears at three places simultaneously and independently. One in uh, seemingly in Russia, one in China, uh, one in, uh, in Germany, uh, in West Germany, <laughs> we are in the Cold War already, <laughs> and one in East Germany. <laughs> okay. And it's called the characteristic polynomial. And the definition is simple. It says the following. We take as a, a presentation of the graph a matrix. And we do the matrix in the following way. We denote uh, the adjacency matrix. We say, if we give a square matrix. How do I clean this? Oh, yeah. We take a square matrix. of the sets of V of G, and V of G here, 1, 2, of V of G, so, and we put zeros in the diagonal, and we put a 1 if there is an edge between I and J, and it's a symmetric matrix, so if it's an edge from I to J, there is also an edge from J to I, 
and it has no loops, so we put zeros here. If you have loops, we put others here. And then, okay, so we have a matrix presentation of a, of a graph. Now, now we, again, we can ask you, once you have a matrix, what comes to your mind? So you go back to your course notes of linear algebra, <laughs> and you find out that if you have matrices, you have all kinds of theorems about uh, characteristic polynomials and so on. So indeed, they, they looked at the characteristic polynomial of this adjacency matrix. And the reason why they did it was chemistry or, or physics. Actually, they wanted to solve the Schrodinger equation. In 1952, nobody could solve the Schrodinger equation manually. So they looked for some heuristic approximation. And they could actually do some prediction about certain molecules by presenting the molecule as a graph and computing this determinant. Okay. So this is called the characteristic polynomial of a graph. And then, then what they do, do, what you do in the first year calculus, uh, algebra, what you do is you compute the eigenvalues of the matrix, which are the zeros of the characteristic polynomial. So they looked at the zeros of the characteristic polynomial. And this is called spectral, this is called the spectrum of a graph. And the theory behind this is called spectral graph theory. And again, you have books of three, 400 pages <laughs> telling you everything you wanted to know or didn't want to know or didn't dare to ask uh, <laughs> about the uh, characteristic polynomial. So here is some literature, again, the, the book by Bix. Then there is the book by, by Sachs and his collaborators, Svetkovich, Dobe, and Sachs. And actually, the Yugoslav school became very, very uh, important in this case. So there is Svetkovic, Rawlinson, and Simic. is a modern book. And this is uh, an amazing book by Trinajstic. He was also in, in Sarajevo, I think. It's called Chemical Graph Theory. And indeed, in the 60s and 70s, there was a very, very uh, heavy activity of, of uh, chemical graph theory with applications to, to uh, aromaticity and to other things. And again, the reason is because they couldn't solve the corresponding uh, molecular equations and shooting equations. Now, I, I had a seminar and I gave a student a project to survey. And I, we have a, my, actually my neighbor is, is a theoretical chemist and he came to the seminar. He liked the lecture very much. It is also on the internet in one of my courses. But he said, you know, it's not quite relevant anymore because today with supercomputers we can approximate the Schrodinger equations much better and the amount of predictive uh, stuff which has been confirmed is okay but we can do today better. Nevertheless, I mean, once a field exists people do it so there are still papers published on, on chemical graph theory and it is still amazing how much information you can, you can extract from from this for 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 chemistry. Why is it called Hanko? Uh, Why is it called? The, the second line. The chemistry. <coughs> no, 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 second line. Hanko. 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 Hanko was a chemist. Uh, okay. <laughs> right. If you want, not in this course, but I can show you the slides of this uh, of the application to chemistry. And it starts with some Japanese, and, uh, but, but uh, Huckel developed the theory of the aromaticity is what you, if you learn some minimal chemistry, you look at this hexagon, and, and then you have some things attached here. And this is uh, Kekule uh, developed this theory. And these are, this is the form of the simplest aroma. If you buy very cheap candy, there is a taste called ice candy, and this is the simplest aroma which can be synthesized and which is understood. And so they developed a, a general theory and they can predict the behavior of molecules, which molecules are, are possible, which are not, by, by associating a certain graphicist. Basically, you, you omit some parts and you keep some other parts in an algorithmic way. And then, then you can compute this characteristic polynomial and you can predict the behavior of those molecules. And, and the, the full theory is called Huckel theory after a person who, uh, if you want, we can have an additional session and I give you a lecture on, on chemical graph theory. 
So still, I, I want to show you a few things. Uh, maybe a jump. So now we can write this polynomial. And you see, it really depends on the presentation. There is a little bit of luck involved here. So here, we take the basis reversed. We associate with the coefficient i, not x to the i, but x to the n equals uh, this number, uh, minus i. So you just do it uh, the other way around. And they did it like this. I don't know whether spontaneously or after trial and error, but, but I want to stress this because we will have, a, we will have later a discussion on this, that the graph polynomial, you know, you can say, I don't want those. I want C prime and I want to associate it with them, but then you have to rewrite those theorems in a different way. So this is consistent with the literature. So then we have C0 is always 1. C1 is always 0. C, the negative value of C2, is the absolute value of the number of edges. And the negative value of C3 is twice the number of triangles of G. Okay. So again, this is an indication that looking at this polynomial in this particular way, I can tickle out some information about the graph. But with hindsight, because I will show you later the results which relate to this, there was a little bit of luck here because it says basically you take the characteristic polynomial, you choose your basis in a lucky way. So, so far lucky was just uh, reverting the order or taking lower factorials or something. And then you interpret the corresponding coefficients and you can read out something. But if I insisted that I write it differently, then, OK, in this case, if it is reverse, I can take the maximum. And you can, this is easy. But if I say, you know, I want actually the falling factorial here, can you give me interpretation of the coefficients then? Then my answer is, I don't know. I mean, I can use uh, so, some, uh, how are they called, uh, transformation of bases. There are standard theorems for polynomials and combinatorial functions. And then I can retranslate this in a funny way. But, but, but uh, it's, it's not obvious otherwise. I have one question. Yes? Is there one more information? I mean, C4. For C4, yes. it has some, but it's less, it's less spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the proof, what you do for C3, you can, you can try to formulate it, but in, in, in natural language it doesn't sound as, as convincing. But yes, the answer is yes. Isn't it like some of the uh, horsepower of eigenvalues? Yeah, something you can. So. Yes, well, once you know this, and you, you can do this as a homework for intelligent or uh, demanding students, you can say, look at the proof for C3, and then try to formulate what you get for C4. And, and I assure you, you get some relevant answer. Now here are some, some more classical theorem. First of all, because the matrix is symmetric, we get all eigenvalues are real. This is, uh, has nothing to do with the graph. This has to do with, with linear algebra. <laughs> but we get if G is connected, then the largest eigenvalue of G has multiplicity no, if G is connected, the largest eigenvalue of G has multiplicity 1. OK, yes. And if G is connected and of diameter at least D, then G has at least D plus 1 distinct zeros. And the complete graph is the only connected graph with exactly two distinct eigenvalues, namely uh, minus 1 and, and whatever you get from this. And if lambda of g is the largest eigenvalue of g, and g is, then g is bipartite if and only if minus lambda of g is also an eigenvalue. So again, this is just to convince you that this seems to be a serious project. If I, if I pick some interesting graph <coughs> polynomial, I have a chance to, to get theorems like this. go on more, but I want to show you more polynomial. Let be a regular graph of degree r. 
then r is an eigenvalue. If g is connected, then the multiplicity of r uh, is uh, 1. For any eigenvalue lambda of g, we have lambda is smaller than r, and the multiplicity of the eigenvalue r is the number of connected components of g. So again, you can play, but this is for the case of regular graphs. So you can play even more along this. Okay, I don't. I skip one. So if you go to my slides, you have more. Now here is the third prominent graph polynomial. Oh, crocodile, giraffe, elephant. <laughs> uh, now we do the following, and it's called the acyclic or matching defect polynomial. And again, it comes from chemistry. So we denote by mk of g the number of k matchings of a graph g, and we set m0 of g is 1 by, by definition. Now what is a k matching? A k matching is a, a subset of independent edges and k many. Okay. So a, a perfect matching is a matching where all the vertices are covered. And k matching is just any k matching. So the two matchings, no, the one matchings are just the number of edges. Okay. So we denote by mk the number of k matchings. And then we form a polynomial and again, if you, if you look now, <laughs> there is something tricky here. We don't form the polynomial. Uh, so the, this one is formed like this. mk is here. The basis is x to the n minus 2k times minus 1 to the k. So actually, this together with this is the basis of your polynomials. And then you take these coefficients. And this is called the acyclic polynomial of G, and also the reference polynomial or the matching defect polynomial. The various names have to do with application in physics and so on. Now again, to show you that this is really an elephant, a prominent member of my zoo. So there is a book by Lovas and Plummer from uh, C86, Matching Theory. It's thick like this, five or 600 pages. And it has about 100 pages about uh, matching polynomial. Again, back we get to three nice stitch. It plays an important role in chemical graph theory. And it plays even a more important role in the standard work on aromaticity in chemistry by, by Garat. Now, every normal mathematician would have defined the polynomial like this. G generating function of g and x is the same uh, coefficients, mk of g. But I'm taking a, a more natural basis from a mathematical point of view. I take this basis. So this is called the matching polynomial or the matching, uh, or the matching generating polynomial in the literature. And you can verify that indeed there is a relation between the two. Namely, the previous one, m of gx, can be written as x to the power n, but n is actually the number of vertices. So you, this is not just a number. This is a graph parameter of, of g, n, times g of a polynomial, this one, of the graph. But you substitute the variable by minus x to the power minus 2. So from a mathematical point of view, you would say, if I know what is the number of vertices, I don't care whether I look at this or at the previous one. They are, they are interpretable. On the other hand, you will see in a moment that, again, there is this strange phenomenon that uh, one has nicer properties than the others. Now, before I go on, I want to show you one polynomial, which, which I don't give the full definition. Okay. Uh, which is called, the main point here at this point in the lecture, later on it will be much more important, is that this is a polynomial which has two variables. 
and it's called by now the Tat polynomial and when Tat wrote his own paper he didn't call it a Tat polynomial he called it a dichromatic polynomial <coughs> I want to make a short remark last year they celebrated the uh, merits of Turing to World War II but what you don't know and maybe you should look up in the Wikipedia is that Tat was much more important than Turing in, 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 even in, he worked in the same institute and he even uh, used the same computer as Turing but he did much more difficult work in, in decrypting so, so on top of it he also is a very important mathematician so, but he wasn't he didn't kill himself and he wasn't gay and he lived very long and he was a very modest person and actually his work was classified till 1990 something so nobody really noticed what, what his merits were. But it, it's very, I think he deserves the credit for it. So. Anyhow, he defined some polynomial in two variables, which today is called the Tat polynomial. I just come from last week, a conference with 50 participants called New Directions in Research on the Tat polynomial. <laughs> and it is very important in knot theory, in statistical mechanics, in quantum theory, quantum computing, chemistry, and by now it has also applications in finance mathematics and, and so on and so on. We will come back to this example uh, just at this point. So this is actually the most prominent. This is the tiger in my zoo. Actually, I give you a definition, but the definition looks completely insane. I mean, no, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, it needs quite a bit of... If you, if you teach it like this and you start with a definition like this, it looks completely insane. So what do we have to know? The graph is given like this. A is a subset of vertices. And VA is the graph is the same number of vertices, but the edges are uh, given by A. So it's called the spanning subgraph. It's the dual of, of induced subgraph if you go the other way around. And then you define a rank of G of the spanning subgraph as the rank of the as the number of vertices in G, which is here, minus the number of connected components given by the spanning subgraph. Now this is meaningful in, in matroid theory. So if you think of, of uh, graphs as special cases of matroid and you want to bother at them, I don't want to bother now with matroids, but then you can see a bit more about this. Now the Tat polynomial is defined as a generating function. You take a sum over all subsets of edges, E. Now here you do a, a, a translation of the basis. We don't care. So you can take a x prime as a variable here and y prime as a variable here. And this is just a linear shift. But you take as an exponent the rank of the full graph minus the rank of the A graph uh, times y prime number of elements in A minus rank of the A graph. So it's of the form sum over all subsets of E variable to the power of some graph parameter times variable, different variable to the power of a different graph parameter which, which depends on A. So as this pattern it's easy to understand. Now for some reason to make theorems nicer we do this shift, and this remains the same. So as I write here, this looks confusing and innocent at the same time. But now it turns out that this, this polynomial is a little bit like a magician's hat where you pull out rabbits, birds, and other surprises. Indeed, now uh, some of them are easy consequences. So if you evaluate it at 1, 1, it gives you the number of spanning trees of G. If you evaluate it at 2, 1, it counts the number of forests. If you evaluate it at 2, 0, it counts the number of acyclic orientations. If you want the chromatic polynomial, you can get it in this way. You take the Tat polynomial times x to the power of connected components times some correcting terms of, of mi minus 1 to the power of something. And in particular, you get that if the graph is connected, this equals 1, this equals uh, 1, so you get an evaluation 
uh, at, 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 at an interesting point. And there are other polynomials in, 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 in computer science, reliability polynomial, flow polynomial, can also be derived from this. So again, this seems to suggest here is a graph polynomial. I have some crazy definition. And again, I give you evidence that, uh, that uh, many things can be tickled out of this. And actually, this list today is much longer. I just don't want to bother you more. Now, actually, I want to skip this. I can quickly say a graph invariant is complete if for two non-isomorphic graphs it gives always different polynomials. So if the polynomial is the same on two graphs, then they happen to be isomorphic. Uh, but but we don't have a natural complete invariance. So, Does it exist? but but uh, no Does no. It exist? Well, you can have with infinitely many variables. You can do stupid things, and with finite variables, you can do artificial things. But there is no no nice animal which 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 happens to be complete. So you tell me if you want a break, or you I continue. I mean. My students in Israel are not capable of more than 50 minutes <laughs> without a break. Uh, <laughs> Russian break? students here. Uh -huh. Can you have, have you still strength? So we continue. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now you, say you have seen uh, chromatic, characteristic, two versions of the matching polynomials. Tat polynomial, and now you wonder how you compare them. I mean, uh, so here are statements you read in the literature, and, and these are uh, I, I, I know more today, but this is, the polynomial is a generalization of the chromatic polynomial. And this we can make precise, and it's true. The tat polynomial does not determine the matching polynomial. In what sense? You can have two graphs on which the tat polynomial gives the same value, but the matching polynomial gives different values. And even also the other way around. You can have two graphs where the matching polynomial gives the same value, and the tat polynomial gives different values. So in this sense, in this sense, we can say that the matching polynomial and the tat polynomial are, in some sense, incomparable. And then we can ask, but is there, is there something which is most general? I mean, obviously, if we had a nice polynomial which was complete, then it would be the most general. But otherwise, uh, is there some animal in this zoo which is an uh, ancestor of all the other animals in the zoo? So here is a. Wait, I saw where is there is. There. So here is a here is a notion which which is natural. Now I may I may have taken too much notation, so if you want at the moment you can H is some subclass, some graph property you like. So maybe you don't want to discuss about all graphs, you want to compare graph polymers only on planar graphs or on anyhow on your favorite graphs, <laughs> regular graphs of degree five or whatever. So H is a subclass, but if you, it doesn't contribute here. Uh, I just want to have the notion defined as an additional parameter. And anyhow, so you can assume it's all the graphs. F is a set of graph invariants, which you already decided you like in a ring. And G is one more graph invariant. And we want to define something which is similar, which is similar to, to logic. Now, what is in logic? You have, uh, you have uh, a consequence relation. A formula is a consequence of a set of formulas. If under every interpretation of the set of formulas which comes out true, also the formula which you look at comes out true. So here we think of the polynomial as a syntactic object, like a formula. And the meaning of the of the is the the set of polynomials which 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 uh, 
which uh, satisfy the same uh, object. So, so a, a graph is a model of a graph polynomial if this polynomial gives the same value on the on this. So, so two two graphs are matching equivalent if the matching polynomial gives the same value. Two graphs are uh, tut equivalent if they give the same value on on tut polynomials. So more in general, we say that f the set induces G on the subclass H, if you want. Or we say G is a consequence of F. If for any two graphs, G1 and G2, which happen to be among those which you like, such that my F, for every F in my big F, I get the same value computing the polynomial, then I also have to get the same value for G. So this is in complete analogy to, to, to model theory. You say that uh, uh, you think of a, a graph being a model of a polynomial if, if computing this polynomial gives, uh, on this graph gives the polynomial you want. By the way, here is a, here is a, I don't have slides on this, but here is a, an amazing, amazing open problem. Assume you go, you go to the forest and you find the polynomial f in z of x. Just you find one. You look at it and you say, huh, maybe this is a chromatic polynomial of some graph. Can I decide by looking at the polynomial whether it could be the chromatic polynomial of a graph? or in general, I mean, of any graph polynomial. Now, it turns out for the chromatic polynomial, a characterization is still not only difficult, but out of reach. This, what's his name we spoke about today? Ha? Huh? The person who, uh, who proved something on the chromatic polynomial, unimodality. Uh, Chun Ha. Yeah. He writes in one of the papers, this problem is still wide open. But, but you can have graph polynomials which are kind of funny in the sense that every polynomial is the polynomial of some graph of this type. So this is, in general, the, the, I call this the inverse problem. You go to the forest, you find a polynomial like a mushroom, and you ask, is this the matching polynomial of some graph? Is this the tut polynomial of some graph? Is this the characteristic polynomial of some graph, and so on. And depending on, on what, so the, this is the inverse problem. Can you give a characterization? Uh, can you decide when this always exists a graph, or under what condition exists a graph? So, so there are still open problems like this. Uh, so that is, uh, we denote by, by uh, in the set of graph invariants induced by F so this is like the, the, the semantic closure relation. Uh, in this, the set of other parameters which are induced by f. So how do we see that this relation holds? Now, in some sense, we have too many things which are equivalent. Or, or in, so let f and g be two graph invariants, whatever they are. Then the following derived invariants of f, big F being those two, are also derived. I mean, take the sum of the two, take the difference, take, the, well, take any formal derivative, take any function which you apply to this. So, so, so changing the basis or something doesn't change this semantic notion. I mean, if, so you can say if the matching polynomial follows from my big F, then also the, the generating matching polynomial follows from my big F, or, or the two versions of the chromatic polynomial follow from my big F. So, so this, this notion really abstracts from the, from the particular choice of the basis we spoke about uh, before. Uh, but this shows, uh, this shows that uh, you need something more to to establish this. So either you want to establish that the basis is a particular basis or you want to establish. But before that, I want to show you examples which fit this notion. So this, I call this the semantic properties of graph polynomials. 
which, which will be very, very important in later development. So if you look again at the characteristic polynomial, then the characteristic polynomial, now it's called P, induces, in this sense I just defined, the number of vertices, or the absolute value of the number of, no, this is the number of vertices, the number of edges and the number of triangles. It doesn't, you should make a note here, we have seen before that actually the third coefficient is one-sixth of the number of triangles. But being one-sixth is, is kind of an overkill. Because if you take a different presentation of the, of the characteristic polynomial, then it will not be one-sixth, it may be one-twelfth, or it may be something cuckoo. But the statement that the number of triangles is determined in the sense that given two graphs, if the characteristic polynomial is the same, then the number of triangles must be the same. What exactly will depend on the, on the presentation of the characteristic polynomial, but it will be still the case. So the, the statement that the characteristic polynomial determines the number of triangles is a semantic statement, whereas the statement, it happens to be one-sixth of the, is not a semantic statement. It's like if you look in linear algebra, being, uh, the determinant being zero is a statement about linear maps, but the statement the uh, matrix happens to be triangular doesn't say anything about uh, maps. If for every set of maps there is a presentation which makes a triangular matrix. So this is similar to this. So here I want to show you that the matching, the characteristic polynomial does not determine the matching polynomial. So here is an exercise. You can see that the characteristic polynomial of the graph 1, 4, a complete graph with one, bipartite graph with one edge and four edges, gives the same value as the disjoint union of a four cycle and a single edge. No, a single vertex, edgeless. Uh, but K14 has no two matchings, whereas C4 does. Hence, the, the characteristic polynomial does not induce the number of connected components, nor does it induce the number, uh, the matching polynomial. Okay, so you can see, to show negatively, you have to find graphs on which you can distinguish. So those two graphs show that uh, you can verify that the matching polynomial is different and you can show that this is connected, this is not connected and you, you can verify that the uh, characteristic polynomial happens to be the same. Now you have, uh, here is another theorem the other way around, the acyclic matching polynomial you have seen before it again determines the number of vertices, it determines the number of edges it determines the number of perfect matchings, it determines the number, the matching generating polynomial, but not the other way around, because if you take the matching polynomial in this way of, of n vertices without edges, then this happens to be one for all n, whereas, uh, no, what are the compute here? Uh, it doesn't. Yes, and I want to show you here something else. I want to show that it doesn't determine the characteristic polynomial and by, by doing this computation. So here for this graph, you, because of multiplicity and disjoint unions, you get one. And if you compute the determinant and the characteristic polynomial of the corresponding graph, you get x to the n. Uh, I still want to go. And you can go on like this now, the following. Now we look at the chromatic polynomial. Again, the chromatic polynomial determines the number of vertices, the number of edges. Uh, it determines the chromatic number in the sense that the chromatic number is the smallest integer a such that he of g a is bigger than zero. Real, yes. Or actually uh, integer. The number of connected components is the multiplicity of zeros of x equals zero. The number of blocks is the multiplicity of zeros x equals one. The girth can also be given in this way and so on. 
So, so the chromatic polynomial seems to, to determine all kinds of interesting graph theoretic properties. Now, if you look, uh, here is a, another, the moment I saw it for the first time, this is another one of the really strange and exciting theorems. And if you think longer about it, then it is a bit less exciting. <laughs> but anyhow, here, here is the original formulation. You take the characteristic polynomial the way we defined it, including the, the, the way the coefficients are given. You take the matching polynomial the way we, the, we defined it with this minus 1 and the n to the minus k. Then here is a strange theorem. In this particular presentation, the characteristic polynomial and the matching polynomial are identical if and only if g is a forest. <coughs> Now, if you are, in some sense, sorry for the word, naive, and before what I know about today, then you say, well, this is, this is a uniquely defined object, and it's natural, and this is how we defined it. And this is also a unique defined object. I found it in the laboratory of chemistry. This is what people do there. And then, indeed, Gutmann uh, proved that those two things are identical in the polynomial ring if and only if the thing is for us. So we can now look at this and I want to, to abstract. So this equality disturbs me, it's too much because I mean uh, it really depends on I have chosen a particip uh, presentation here, I have chosen a presentation here uh, and if I'm less naive about choosing those presentations and this looks like an accident. I mean, maybe you can always choose a presentation to do anything uh, like this. And actually, I have a theorem which, which says this. But there is still semantic content to this statement. Namely, it says that the characteristic polynomial determines the matching polynomial. And the matching polynomial determines the characteristic polynomial on trees. Forest. Huh? Forest. Forest, sorry, yes. On forests, and in general, not. Okay? So this is why I had this H before. If you think, you know, my world is only forest, then you can say, indeed, the characteristic polynomial, if two forests have the same characteristic polynomial, then they have the same matching polynomial. And if they have the same matching polynomial, they have, no, sorry. If two graphs, yes, give the same value for the characteristic polynomial, then they also the matching polynomial gives the same value on those two graphs and uh, vice versa. Okay, so this theorem was first published in '77 by Gutmann, and then it was uh, Gutmann and uh, no, sorry, Royland. Uh, Gotthil. Uh, this is almost inaccessible, but uh, there is another paper by Gutmann and Gotthil which gives the, the state. Okay. What is? Function G. Uh, no, M is the matching polynomial in this funny definition, and G is the matching polynomial as a generating function. Mk to the times uh, x to the k. Okay. And what I say here, so the matching polynomial determines M, and M determines the matching polynomial. And the same is true for, for the other version of the, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, <coughs> in general, this is not true at all. This I want to skip because there is a confusing uh, thing. But here is another, so seeing this theorem we have seen before, uh, Farrell and Whitehead proved a similar theorem uh, where they uh, try to connect the chromatic polynomial and the matching polynomial on uh, triangle-free graphs. 
So excited by what I showed you before, they said, can I find another class of graphs instead of forests such that the chromatic polynomial and the matching polynomial somehow are related? And uh, it turns out that they don't use the chromatic polynomial, but they use the, the dual. So the chromatic bar is the chromatic polynomial compute <coughs> on the complement of, of G, on the complement graph of G. And then they found such a strange relation. But I will show you later that th this actually is rather meaningless. I mean, in the sense that we can produce uh, things like this rather easily in general. It very, very much depends on the choice of basis, but, but when they did this, they weren't aware of this. So again, the chromatic polynomial is not determined by the TAT polynomial because of the number of connected components, but on connected graphs, we have that the TAT polynomial determines the chromatic polynomial. Okay. And the TAT polynomial by itself, the other way around, is not determined by the chromatic polynomial. So this really shows that uh, on connected graphs, the TAT polynomial is a proper generalization of the chromatic polynomial. And uh, in general, it is almost true if you smuggle in the additional parameter of the number of connected components, then you can phrase the version, which is also true the other way around. And there is a sketch of proof here. Uh, the, the, the important thing I want to show you is this. Uh, TAT showed that the chromatic polynomial can be computed from the TAT polynomial by taking minus 1 to the number of vertices minus the number of connected components times x to the number of connected components times the TAT polynomial evaluated at 0 and 1 minus x. And this is the reason why why, why uh, the, the, you need that the number of connected components is the same. So if the number of connected components of two graphs are the same, then the, the relationship holds. And then there are people who looked at for which graphs is the uh, for which graphs is the TAT polynomial uh, determining the graphs. I mean, given two graphs having a particular TAT polynomial, then they must be. So if you take two wheels, wheels are, are graphs. So yes. Just like this. With n spikes. So you can say that two wheels for n and n prime have the same TAT polynomial if and only if n equals n prime and things like this. So people analyzed when this happens and they found all kinds of families of graphs where they can prove properties like this. And then we go on and we find out that the TAT polynomial and the matching polynomial are not at all related to each other. So you can find two graphs which have the same TAT polynomial but not the same matching polynomial and you can find two graphs which have the same matching polynomial and don't have the same TAT polynomial. You can read this later in the, in the slides. I just want to... So, okay. so let's make a, a small, not a break, but <laughs> let's reflect what you have seen so far. I've given you a guided tour through my zoo. Though I only picked uh, famous animals. Okay, so in, in Sydney and in, in and you have a zoo in Dijon? Yes, I think so. Uh, so the, we will find the same. I mean, these are the, the, the major players in any zoo. So polynomial graph invariants are still a mystery somehow. We, we have seen that there may be something exciting there. Uh, but we, we haven't looked very seriously at this consequent relation. Uh, can we identify what it means to be a good graph polynomial, a good graph invariant? And then later we can also ask what is the complexity of computing those invariants. So here is a challenge which bothers me. Is you come to me and you say, I heard your lecture. I found a new graph polynomial. 
I was traveling in the mountains and I found <laughs> uh, like a new mushroom, yes, I found the graph polynomial. I would like to write a PhD about this graph polynomial. What should I answer you? What should I answer you? Now, if you come to me and say, I want to prove the Riemann conjecture, what do I answer to you? It's out of competition. <laughs> Unless you show me already with deep understanding, you know, I have a new plan and this is, and the other people haven't tried this and I see and then I say maybe go ahead. But otherwise I will tell you this is out of competition. On the other hand, I don't know, you, you bring me, I will show you many, many, many graph polynomials. And you, you say, you know, here is this inspiration, maybe I can find uh, many points where I can evaluate it, maybe I can describe many consequences of my polynomial. What should I answer you? Maybe it is actually equivalent to some graph polynomial which has already been studied. So probably I would, an I would answer you, you know what, go ahead for three months, work very hard, and then we discuss. Three months investment is not that bad, and if you find some line which may be more promising than just saying I want to imitate this game, then you can go ahead and otherwise I will say you be careful. Okay. But this is the question which really bothers me. Because I've refereed many papers in the literature where people come and say, you know, blah 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 invented this polynomial, now I have my new polynomial and uh, here are three properties of this polynomial. And people accept the paper. Now I started to reject papers like this because I said, I need more motivation. <coughs> when you don't publish a paper saying, here is a number with 200 digits, and I show you this is not a prime. Mm -hmm. Even if you can claim that nobody ever has published this before. <laughs> so so there, there is a question here. What, what statement justifies and depending where you are, I mean, uh, if I'm uh, uh, the standards I grew up with at the uh, Institute of Technology in Zurich and uh, Soviet mathematics of the 50s and the European mathematics of the 50s, many of the papers I've seen on graph theory, actually also on graph theory, if you look at the first 10 years of the Journal of Graph Theory, by now it has become very serious. But if you look at the first 10 years of the Journal of Graph Theory, you know, most of it you can give as homework with two hints. And some of it are relevant papers. I'm not saying there were none. But I would claim 90% of the, of the papers of the first years of the Journal of Graph Theory were just, you know, beating, beating uh, foam, as they say. <laughs> so, so what do you do here? And, and I, I'll give you an example. You, you take, uh, you take uh, now we have at least one way we have of of, of stupidly defining, I mean not stupidly, but innocently, naively defining graph polynomials. Give me a graph property uh, of a subset of a graph. Uh, I'm a dominating set, I'm a vertex cover, I'm a connected component, I am uh, whatever, okay? So let's say just for the sum of examen, A is a dominating nominating set of G. So then we say D of G K equals, you tell me when I have to stop, is the number of dominating sets of G of size K. Everyone know dominating set? Do you know? <laughs> okay, no, okay, sir. So, huh? I forgot the definition. No, the, well, first of all, for the polynomial, it's not important, but the definition, <laughs> yeah, because I take anything, but the dominating set is a set of vertices where every other set is a neighbor of it. So think of, uh, of uh, the good old times when the generals were sitting on the mountains and doing war, so a dominating set is a set of hills where you can see all the action in the field. I think this is why the name was given actually, okay? But you can say dominating set, 
uh, vertex cover, uh, connected component, whatever this. And then you define big D of G x equals sum of dk of g x to the k. And if you don't like x to the k, you can take x to the falling factorial k. Or you can take n minus k. Okay? Or 2n minus k, whatever you want. Yeah? Graph polynomial. So now you come to me and say, I want to write a PhD about this polynomial. What should I tell you? Now, obviously, I will tell you, have you looked at it? Can you at least tell me some properties? Is it multiplicative? If you take this joint union, get you, is it multiplicative? If you change the basis, like in the chromatic polynomial, is it also multiplicative for, for, uh, no, what was it called? Join operation. Uh, can you say something about the location of zeros? Can you say something about other number graph parameters are implied by it as we did so far? How do you start, assume you have a couple of results like this. How do you write the introduction to your paper which you want to sell to a journal? And you write, well, blah, 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 wrote about matching polynomial and they have results like this. Blah, 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 wrote about uh, that polynomial and they have results like this. I write about <laughs> dominating set polynomial and I have results like this. Is this a serious motivation? Just because somebody dances like this, you also want to dance like this? I mean, no, what argument do you need? Now, the people in the chromatic polynomial or matching polynomial will tell you, but I can do chemistry using this. So can you do chemistry using dominating set polynomial? <laughs> But you understand what bothers me. So the, the, the rest of the three lectures, Sama wants to, to give a hint in which direction we, we are going to, 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 to look at this. And this is a repeat. So now I use what I did before, but change a bit the notation. I have two graph polynomials, P and Q. In, in a fixed number of indeterminates, but maybe different. It may also be zero indeterminates. It may be an element in a, in, a, in, a, in a ring, if you want. So then we say, as we did before, Q determines P over a class of graphs, like forest or what you've seen before. If, but then we change the name. We say Q is at least as distinctive than P and we write Q is bigger than P. If for all graphs G1 and G2 in your class, whenever Q applied to G1 and G2 gives the same polynomial, then also P applied, there is a misprint here, P. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have you heard of the devil of misprints? No. If, if, you leave, if you leave your paper long enough in the computer and you read it again, he will add new misprints which you haven't seen before. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, he lives really in the computer. A very, very nasty person. Okay, and then we, we, we have some notation and if C is all graphs, or it is understood in our context, we, we, we don't write it. I, I have one question. Yes. In the first sentence, you say, I see the uh, graph property. Uh, graph property is just a class of graphs you like. Okay. Instead, of, instead of talking about all graphs, you can apply this definition on all planar graphs, okay. on all connected graphs, on all forests, on all triangle-free graphs. So we can say that uh, on triangle-free graphs, this is stronger than that, or this is equivalent to that. OK, okay so the equivalence is just both directions. And it applies also to graph parameters. So if, if uh, two, graph, two graphs have the same 
girls, then they have the same kukuriku <laughs> value. Okay. So, so this is the notion of, of, of equivalence. And then we have seen the chromatic polynomial determines many things we have seen of my list. Now here is the d max is the maximal degree and d average is the average degree of a graph. So if a graph is regular then d max is just a, a degree and the average would also be the same. But in general they are incomparable, just to give you an example. The TAT polynomial determines the chromatic polynomial on connected graphs or on two graphs which have the same number of connected components, but not on all graphs. Now here is an attempt of, of saying that somehow uh, would I have a better version later. So here P and Q are two graph polynomials and U is some auxiliary polynomial. You want to say that somehow up to multiplication with U they are the same and then you write down the definition. But this is kind of outdated. I, I have a better analysis of this situation. So anyhow, but we have seen that if F is the class of forests, then the characteristic polynomial and uh, defect matching polynomial are, are equivalent. So this is a notion which is not just my crazy abstract definition which I have taken from the literature. Now people indeed look at uh, P now is your, your favorite graph polynomial and they look at P unique or P equivalent graphs. So what is it? Two graphs are again on some class C. Uh, two graphs are P equivalent if they give this, if the computing the P polynomial on them gives the same value and they are p unique if they are the only graph for which you get this value. And p is complete for c if every graph in the class is unique. And people look at these problems. There are papers in the literature very much. So here is a, here are some, somebody called these sanity checks that the definitions make sense. So if p and q are two polynomials, and Q is more general than P or more distinctive, DP distinctive power, then <coughs> if G are Q equivalent, then they are also P equivalent. If G is P unique, then it's also Q unique. And if P is complete, then it also is complete for Q. This is just to, to tie up things. Now I have more examples here. I have finished one and a half hours. And you so, finish uh, one hour 40? Uh, one hour 40, but still I want to. I'll show you one at least. So here is a paper. Uh, the graphs. So now you pick your favorite polynomial, a chromatic polynomial. I must say I would not have... Here is a paper which was published and it had some attention and I'm not sure I would have told my student to publish this without more results. Because the proofs are not really difficult. Maybe the definitions were new when they, when they published it. So I, I don't want to be overcritical. So I didn't say I wouldn't have told my said I'm not sure I would have told my student. Okay. But here is the theorem. En is the graph of n vertices without edges. Kn is the clique with n vertices. Knn is the bipartite, complete bipartite graph with n, n, n edges. And they are all he unique for n equals uh, bigger than equal to 1. So here is something funny happening. If you take the cycles, then they are he unique for n bigger than 3. Uh, 
And obviously, if they are smaller, they happen to be the clicks. So they fully. Any two trees on n vertices are he equivalent. And you can go to this book by Donko and Theo, and you find many, many, many such statements. For the characteristic polynomial, this appears in a paper by Noy. Now, Noy has a very good name. He has very good papers in graph theory. So I'm not. But anyhow, he has a, has, has a paper, graph determined by polynomial invariance. And he looks at a characteristic polynomial. And he shows that KNN is unique for the characteristic polynomial. The line graphs for you, uh, K and N is a clique. The line graph is where you reverse edges and vertices. Uh, the line graphs of a clique are unique unless N equals 8. And for N equals 8, there are three exceptions. Now, this is curious. So as a curiosity, it's an interesting remark. But somehow, as a paper, it, uh, it asks more new questions than it answers. Okay. Now, if you take the line graphs of KNN, the situation is even more curious, because they are unique for n is different from 4. And for n equals 4, there is one exception. So you can say a graph is almost a graph polynomial determines something almost always if there are only finitely many exceptions or something like this. But somehow I, 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 would, I would like to ask more questions after I see this. Now we have seen the matching polynomials. Now they are not really equivalent because of what? Because in here, you don't see the isolated vertices. It's multiplicative on this joint union. You add isolated vertices, you don't see the matchings. Here, you see the isolated vertices because of this trick. So actually, this trick comes by doing this and multiplying it from outside by x to the power n. And then for some reason, I want it symmetric or something. So they have some reasons of physics why they do alternating coefficients. But in a precise sense, they are not equivalent. This is more precise than this. But on connected graphs, they are the same. And if they only study molecules, they couldn't care less because molecules are connected. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> but, but, uh, so in the same paper by Noy, so the paper by Noy contains uh, much more than I show, but then he looks at the same for matching polynomial. And then he gives some analysis uh, which graphs are unique for which matching polynomials. And you can go back to read those slides afterwards. I just want to show you uh, uh, what happens here. And here I ask a, a question. But you can, you can do here uh, at least a master's thesis. You can try to, to, to continue this line of research and add some more curious uh, facts if you find them. Now, Noy was, uh, so at some point he, he had also a student, uh, Anna Demir, who is now a professor somewhere else. And then they con continued this, so they did it also for the Tat polynomial. So the collection of all those results together really gives an interesting picture, but again asks, asks more questions than it answers. So it opens the door to a landscape, and, and you, you wonder what is going on. So there is a list of uh, the wheels. Wheels are t unique for all n. Wheels are he unique for this, this, and this, for, wheel, for, for even ends. But for 5 and 7, they are not. So again, then you wonder what happens here. And in general, as far as I know, it is still, and there is still some open problems here. But here is an interesting, here is an interesting conjecture, which I want, and this is what I finish, I think, today. Uh, where are we? 
Now I have 30 more slides, so no, 20 more slides. <laughs> Anyhow, almost, uh, we say almost all graphs are t unique. If what? We take t u of n, so and this is in his case is the Tat polynomial. So this is the number of graphs which are t unique of size n, and this is the number of all graphs of size n. And they say, or we, we can say, that almost all graphs are tat unique if the limit of this goes to 1. You know, this is how Bolobash would think about those problems. He doesn't care much about. Uh, is it going to be bigger than epsilon for any land, uh, any past? I'll give you some later some references <laughs> I got. Uh, but it's an open problem. They conjecture that this is true, and, uh, and it's open. But recently there was some progress. So if you, if you go to, to Google Scholar and you look who quotes this paper, you get some update about what has been done recently. But this, this is indeed an interesting uh, problem because uniqueness doesn't depend on the presentation of the, of the Tat polynomial. I mean, if it is T unique and you make a change of basis or something, then it still remains T unique. So this is a semantic property. And then you wonder whether this is true. And maybe for another graph polynomial, you can prove it is true. I'll show you, a, I'll show you later in this course, I'll show you a polynomial which is both a generalization of the Tat polynomial and the matching polynomial, but is more distinctive than the Tat polynomial. When I couldn't find a student who was willing to work on it, whether this is true if you replace T by, by this more general polynomial. But this would be a publishable paper because you say here is a conjecture by Bolobash and so on. Here is a generalization of a polynomial. No, I'm serious. A polynomial which generalizes both the matching and the, and the Tat polynomial, which definitely makes it interesting. And at least for this polynomial, I can prove that almost all graphs are, are unique. But it's an open problem. Okay, I'll, I'll, at the moment we will see how we develop. I think I, I stop today here. And uh, oh. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>